Facebook and everywhere as well. And we will uh, get going in just a few moments with introductions and such. All right, hey everybody. Welcome, uh, I'm Jeff Martin with Magic City Books. We're so thrilled to have you joining us for another in our virtual author event series, which we have been doing for over a year now and have had the great pleasure of hosting well over 150 virtual author events with such a wide range of, of, of amazing people. And it's been a great way to stay connected with all of you, but I'm also excited to tell you that uh, as we approach these summer months, we're going to start easing back slowly into doing some in-person things, some outdoor activities, some, some safe opportunities as we're getting more and more vaccinated and, and uh, starting to ease back into whatever that normal space looked like. Uh, but it's been really wonderful to, to have this tether to you, our audience, and, uh, and we'll continue doing some of these virtuals. I would imagine this will be kind of a hybrid uh, moving forward for a while. And uh, also, you know, we may have the opportunity to speak with people that may not be able to travel as also or maybe not even uh, you know, inside the country. So I think it'll be a good opportunity to have this new tool um, in our toolbox for, for moving forward. Um, I would like to encourage you to see what we have coming up. We have a quite busy next few months still. Go to our website, magiccitybooks.com. We'll, we'll put a link in the chat here to all of our future events. I won't go through that full list, uh, but I would encourage you to check that out. Um, as you know, Tulsa has been quite in the news of late. We just commemorated the 100th anniversary of the Tulsa Race Massacre of 1921 and had many, many programs around that and, and uh, also just were able to take part and be witness to a lot of the wonderful community uh, commemorations that happened with some of our partner organizations and, and just help amplify all the great work that was happening here. And of course, now that the national media has left and the global media has left and things have calmed down a bit, our goal really is to keep that conversation going and not make it just a one weekend thing that happened on the 100th anniversary. And it's been great to see. I just saw our uh, list of the best-selling books in Oklahoma. It just comes out every week. And I think six of the top 10 books are about the race massacre or are related to that. And I'm hoping that people will, in some ways, use this as a, as a beginning to start learning more and more about that. There's certainly more tools and resources to know uh, about that history than ever before. So I would encourage you to spend some time this summer with your uh, beach reads, mix those up a little bit with some history and learn some of the some of those important things as well. Um, today we're gonna be talking with Professor Carol Anderson who is the Charles Howard Chandler Professor and Chair of African American Studies at Emory University and also the author of Many, many wonderful books. I'm sure many of you have read White Rage, which won the National Book Critics Circle Award. Um, one person vote, talk about a, a book we should be talking about right now with all the voter suppression things happening around the country and all these different statewide initiatives to, to uh, limit access. Um, but today we're actually gonna be talking about uh, Professor Anderson's new book, The Second, uh, which is, as you may guess, about the Second Amendment race and guns in a fatally unequal America. Uh, lots to talk about here, and uh, we're going to dive right into it. Professor Anderson, welcome to Tulsa Virtually, and thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you so much for having me, Jeff. Um, I, I um, was interested when I first saw this book about the scope that you cover here. I think a lot of times we think about the Second Amendment in very contemporary terms about arguments we may, we may be having about the National Rifle Association or even school violence or some of those very contemporary problems. But this book takes us in the way back machine centuries into the past and talks about the seeds that were planted um, that led there. So maybe we kind of begin with where you start this, this narrative and how you kind of uh, saw the arc of this story beginning. So what launched this book actually was the killing of Philando Castile in 2016. Um, because here you had a black man who was pulled over by the police and who, you know, the, he said, your officer, I have a licensed weapon. And the officer started shooting and killed Philando Castile. And so he's gunned down simply because he has a licensed weapon. He wasn't threatening anyone. He wasn't doing anything um, that was uh, perilous, um, but he died. And the NRA went silent. And that struck me, uh, the, si the virtual silence of the NRA. 
And you have then journalists saying, well, don't black people have second amendment rights? And I thought as a historian, that's a great question. My research covers uh, the, the civil and human rights of African-Americans. I'm looking at what I call that fractured citizenship. And, but this was a right that I had not explored. And so I went back and I ended up back in the 17th century. Um, in 17th century Virginia, in 17th century South Carolina, looking at the slave codes, these laws that really dealt with the fear that the, the white colonists had of black people, the fear of the enslaved, the fear of an uprising and the, the laws and the architecture put in place to deal with that fear, to provide security uh, against a slave revolt a security for that white community. And, and that for me becomes the genesis of the second amendment, that fear of black people. So, you know, bringing up that idea, the, the, the white based fear of, of slave revolts of which there were some, um, and, and, but it's kind of this, this thing that I hadn't ever quite thought about in the way that you made me think of it with the book, which was, we created this problem by creating this infrastructure of the, you know, slavery industrial complex that existed at that time. It was truly an, an industry. And then even people that I think started to think differently about it, someone like Thomas Jefferson, even, for example, understood the irony within this injustice, but knew that if, if you went another way, it would cause problems. And we kind of, they kind of painted themselves into this corner where now they are scared of the problem that they created. And I hadn't ever quite thought of it in exactly those terms. It was, you know, that fear may have impeded even the people that had some reservations about the general concept of slavery, but it's like, well, hey, we can't give those people guns because I'm now afraid that we'll get retribution. So talk about that a little bit more. And, and so you had um, the kind of skittishness in some of the colonists who were, who looked at slavery and said, this is an abomination. But you had those like Jefferson who said, I fear that God is just. Um, and, and the rest of that quote is basically, and he's gonna come back and get us for this. <laughs> uh, but there's like nothing we can do about it. Um, so so that, that kicking the can down the, the street being unwilling to, to, to dismantle slavery, being unwilling to even conceptualize what freedom would look like for black people um, and afraid that the, the, the language of freedom, uh, of democracy, of equality that was coursing through that era um, would somehow move, but would, would be permeable and move outside of the white confines and into that enslaved community. And that black community would get the wrong ideas in their head. But that community already knew what freedom was and knew that what they were having wasn't it. And so that was part of the, the, the anxiety, the angst, the fear that was coursing through there. And you had a series of, of slave revolts and you had a series of, of attempted slave revolts planned slave revolts. And with each one, the response was not, you know, right, slavery is wrong. Instead, the response was, we need to double down. Um, and so this is where you see tighter and tighter laws about uh, access to guns, access to weapons, access to books, um, access to literacy. This is where you also see the rise of the architecture of the slave patrols and the militia. Uh, which were designed to keep that enslaved population under control. Um, and so the doubling down, in fact, then provides a level of legitimacy for what is an illegitimate enterprise. So it, what often goes unspoken with Second Amendment advocates is that second part about the well-regulated militia. Um, having studied it so long, for people that maybe not, that may not fully understand the breadth of the amendment. Talk about what they meant, or at least possibly intended by that well-regulated militia, the right to bear arms in a well-regulated militia. And, and so that emerges out of it. So let me back up and just deal with the narrative that we currently have, which is that this militia 
are these heroic folks who fended off the British. They're there to you know, fight back against uh, domestic tyranny and a foreign invasion. And they were bedrock to saving America for the creation of America. And so this thing is really swaddled in the flag. Actually, during the war for independence, the, the militia could not be counted on. Um, sometimes they would show up, sometimes they wouldn't. Sometimes they fight, sometimes they wouldn't. George Washington was beside himself at how unreliable the militia were. Uh, Governor Morris out of New York said that the militia, um, to rely upon the militia for a, to repel a, a foreign invasion, to come against a professional army is like relying upon a broken reed. So th they knew at the time that that militia was no match for a full blown professional army. We also get that domestic tyranny piece, but here you have um, a government that, you know, you had Shays Rebellion that happened right before the Constitutional Convention. And Shays Rebellion were white men who were attacking the Massachusetts government over taxation and seizure of property uh, for non-payment of taxes. And the militia weren't putting them down. In fact, members of the militia were joining Shays Rebellion. Um, and it required Boston merchants uh, who had to pay for basically a mercenary army to put down Shays Rebellion. So what they knew at the time was that you couldn't count on that militia to fight against domestic tyranny. Um, instead, what they would do was they would attack the government um, that was just trying to do government functions. What the militia were really, really good at were putting down slave revolts. And that's the language that you see happening there with that well-regulated militia. It was, we do not want the, the mob of Shays Rebellion. We want a well-regulated militia. And this was coming out of the uh, ratification convention in Virginia, where Patrick Henry and George Mason are going toe to toe with the Federalist and James Madison because the draft constitution had put control of the militia under the federal government. And Mason and Henry were like, we will be left defenseless. If there is a slave revolt, we will be left defenseless. And you know that the North detests slavery because that meant that those folks from Pennsylvania could not be counted upon to, to, to vote to send the militia down to Virginia if there was a slave revolt. And, and they wanted protection. And they had been very clear that they wanted protection. And just like in the debates over the Constitution, they were willing to, to play a game of hardball. You know, when we were kids, we used to call playing a game of chicken. Um, where you would see, right, who was going to dodge, who was going to blink, who thought their life was more important than whatever that thing was out there. And so they were willing to play a game of chicken with the United States of America and the Constitution in order to get the, the militia protection that they wanted. So that well-regulated militia was about having the uh, force powerful enough to quell a slave revolt. So, you know, to bring things up to the current day a little bit, um, when we were having the commemoration of the Black Wall Street Massacre of 1921, uh, there were a lot of different things that happened around that. One of the things that happened was a Second Amendment gun owners march down on Greenwood and that part of town that was, you know, Black gun owners. And when it was announced a few weeks before that, of course, it caused some consternation amongst the, the white community here. You could see, you know, if you wanted to go anywhere that was horrifically toxic, you would go to any local news station, social media, and see the, the cesspool of comments and things like that. Um, but of course, you know, we have gun things like that here all the time. We have gun shows, we have Second Amendment marches, we have NRA things. This is not something new. What was new about it, of course, was the color of the people partaking in the march. And there was even questions about would they get the permit and, you know, all kinds of silly things. Uh, it eventually ended up happening. It was totally peaceful. There was no big problem with it. But, you know, you could hear, you know, local business owners kind of saying, should I close my business? All these things, things that people would not say if it was otherwise. So, and that's just two weeks ago, a week and a half ago. Um, 
And it's rooted in this problem that's just been there originally. So, you know, think about that. What do you have to say about something like that happening in 2021? I'm not surprised. Um, and that's what I'm laying out in this book, that the anti-Blackness, which I define as the casting of Black people as dangerous, the casting of Black people as a threat to the white community, uh, the casting of, of African-Americans as, as toxic, um, that that courses through our history. Um, and so, as you know, I track this from um, the 17th century all the way up to the 21st century. And so the response to black gun ownership, the response to a black militia um, is not surprising in the 21st century. It's, it's, it's one of the things that we said when um, with the insurrection at the Capitol on January 6th, that if that had been a group of black folk storming the Capitol, it would have been a massacre. Um, and so part of what I'm doing with this book is to make legible the things that we, we know um, would happen um, because of the, the, the cultural ethos that is here, that black is dangerous. It is what led to uh, Kyle Rittenhouse, who was the, the white teenager who went up to Kenosha, Wisconsin and, and was welcomed by the police as he's carrying an AR-15 um, and shoots three men, killing two of them, seriously wounding one, walks up with back to the police with his hands up and they don't see him as a threat and he goes home. But Tamir Rice, a 12 year old black child is playing alone in a park with a toy gun. And granted the toy didn't have the orange tip on it but it's Ohio is an open carry state. And so he's in the pavilion by himself. He was not a threat. Within two seconds, he is gunned down. Within two seconds, of the police officer's arrival, he is gunned down. Black as threat. So what you saw happening there in Tulsa with, oh my gosh, black folks carrying guns. Um, should I close my business? Um, what are we gonna do? That is, that is standard. And think about the, 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 the tripwire for, the Tulsa race massacre in the first place. It was black men coming to the courthouse um, where Dick Rowland was being held to try to make sure that justice actually happened and that that young man was not going to be lynched. And so when they came to the courthouse armed, it infuriated that white mom. It was like, how dare you, uh, you know, how dare you believe that you have the right to bear arms and that you have the right to challenge us in what we're going to do. And, and, and the result was 35 to 40 blocks just wiped out, hundreds of people killed. Um, yeah, you know, it, it's interesting too, because you know, uh, as far as we know, on the steps of the courthouse, it was a skirmish of someone trying to take someone's gun from them that the gun then went off supposedly. And so the gun played a, you know, very much a uh, kind of pivotal role in that sparking that, that, that moment. Um, you, you've spoken so much about, you know, we, uh, White Rage, which is an amazing book. I would encourage people to read that. And I think all these books obviously play, a, you know, I think you're, you're saying a much larger picture here with what you're writing about, but that issue that you brought up about fear of blackness, generally. It's such a fascinating concept in the sense of so much of the issues you write about, like you said, are, you know, started, you know, several hundred years ago. But I do wonder if we, um, as a society, still have this irrational fear of Black men, for the most part, because there is this unconscious sense of we are owed something, like we de deserve some kind of retribution because we feel that, you know, we know what happened historically. I may not be saying that the right way, but maybe you can kind of understand where, where I'm going with that. And, you know, is there a sense of society being aware of what happened? We're not really dealing with it, but we kind of feel like we're scared because we feel like we deserve it in a way. I don't know. Think about what that will. You know, and, 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 you know, one of the things I laid out um, in the, the period of enslavement was the fear of retribution that 
that the enslaved would be so angry at what was being done to them that if they got free, um, they would just wipe out the white community. Um, retribution would just course through that. And it's one of the other things um, that I talked about in the framing of the Constitution, how the word slavery isn't mentioned in the Constitution, but it is there. It is, it is just seeping into the words, into the soil of the Constitution. And that one of the men um, said, you know, it's not, it's not just fear, it's guilt. It's guilt. Um, that we, we're afraid to even let that word slavery come into the Constitution. And, and so there's this recognition, and you mentioned that, I think, in, the, in our first part of the conversation about this recognition that what is being done to Black people via slavery is wrong, just fundamentally, basically wrong. But it gets all of this this cloaking around it, justification around it, biblical justification, then scientific justification, then political and legal justification. All of that, um, all of that edifice is, is, is constructed based on what we know is wrong. And so when Thomas Jefferson says, I fear that God is just, yes. So, that sense of, of retribution is there. Uh, it's that they're going to do to us what we did to them. But when you really look at what these movements for equality are about, it is to be able to live free. It is to be able to live a whole life. Um, it's not about retribution. It is about being able to, to, to have a job and get paid what you're worth. Um, about being able to have quality education, access to quality health care, to have your full citizenship rights. Once again, everybody, the, the book we're speaking about is The Second Race and Guns in a Fatally Unequal America. I would encourage all of you to get a copy of this book, read it, and hopefully discuss it with people in your life. Um, and if you have questions for Professor Anderson, please put those in here and we'll get to some of those in just a bit. Um, I'm curious, let's move on to the kind of 1950s, 1960s civil rights era. Um, you have these parallel tracks where you kind of have the um, more militant wing of it. So this would be kind of the Malcolm X of the world. Then you have the kind of nonviolent Martin Luther King side of it, which was much more embraced in a certain sense by the white establishment. Um, do you think some of that was really because, you know, someone like a Malcolm X, especially in his early part of his career, is literally walking down the street with armed guards and much more of a, I would say, more of an intimidating presence than, say, someone like Martin Luther King Jr. and, and how that played into this larger narrative about who, who gets to be powerful and who gets to have, you know, uh, guns and, and things like that? I think that one of the things we have to remember is that the strategy of nonviolence was a way to deal with that narrative of black people as being inherently violent, inherently criminal. And it was a way to bring the cameras in um, so that America could see how violent Jim Crow really was, how black people just trying to sit at a lunch counter um, would bring down heaps of, of fists and, and, and condiments all over them. Um, brutality all over Black folks being nonviolent. Because what that does is it short circuits the narrative that, well, you know, they had it coming. Well, what did they do um, to, to get that? Well, you saw that they were, they weren't, they didn't know their place. Well, you saw that they were being violent. You saw that they were being threatening. You know, they were just being Black. And so the, the nonviolence was a way to, to, um, short circuit that traditional fallback narrative. Um, and you think about that's a narrative that we're in right now. Well, what did he do? <laughs> he must have done something to get shot. Um, and, and with that, that, the nonviolence in the movement, you also had black folks armed, uh, like the deacons for defense, who were protecting uh, these nonviolent protesters from the violence that was raining down on them. So we've got a narrative of the civil rights movement that is more bifurcated than it needs to be. 
Um, you had the, the, the militant I, I, I talk about with um, the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense. And with the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense, they arose as a response to the mass of police brutality that was raining down on Black folks and that there was no accountability within the system to bring these police officers to justice, to, to make that violence stop. Um, so that there were killings, there were beatings, um, there were false arrests, there was just acts of humiliation and degradation and, and, and not a mumbling word out of the, the political legal establishment. So the Black Panther Party for self-defense arose because of that. And one of the things that they did was they knew the law, they knew California's law. And California's law at the time allowed open carry. California's law at the time also allowed for civilians to have to stand a certain distance away from a police officer doing his or her duty. And so the Panthers would stand there with their guns, openly carrying, watching the police arresting black folk. And the police did not like it. They did not like the policing the police thing at all. Um, and so they ran to Don Mulford, who was a assemblyman, a California assemblyman, and said, we need help. Um, and Mulford obliged with the Mulford Act, um, which was um, written with the help of the NRA um, that, that banned open carrying of weapons. So it banned, it made illegal what the Panthers were doing that was legal in order to bring down police violence in the black community. Um, and, and the Panthers with their guns sent a shockwave through white America. Um, and, and this is where you get this, 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 this narrative, this bifurcated narrative that has Martin Luther King as nonviolent, but remember the violence that he faced. Remember the, the because what they were doing was disrupting a power structure. Um, and, 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 and that was seen as violent. Um, and, and so, but it was a way to try to pit these, uh, these two against each other that, you know, King was doing it the right way and the Panthers doing it the wrong way. Um, but when you think about the violence that, that the civil rights movement faced here in the South, it was seen as doing it the wrong way because they weren't being silent and accepting Jim Crow as the way of life. You know, I've had a few conversations uh, since the film Judas and the Black Messiah came out mm -hmm. and about Fred Hampton and, and some of the things around there. And it's been so interesting to me that so many young people don't have any real awareness of the Black Panther Party and especially its heyday at that point and kind of how how much it was in the conversation nationally, how important it was, how unique it was in a moment to have something like that happen. And I think that it's somewhat faded in, in, you know, in people's mind, that, that kind of potency of that moment for them. Um, so it's interesting to have some, some pop cultural things kind of bring that to the forefront a little bit more. But what, why do you think that the Black Panther Party of the civil rights and early Vietnam, you know, or Vietnam era kind of seem to kind of fade from the national dialogue and not have the same level of impact? Um, I think it was several things. Um, one is that they, so one is that they got reduced to just guns. Um, and the Black Panther Party was about community empowerment and community self-defense. So they had a free breakfast program they had a met, ran medical clinics um, because these were the things that the community needed in order to be strong. That breakfast program was defined as being a nefarious activity by J. Edgar Hoover of the FBI, a nefarious activity that had to be stopped. Um, the, the, the law enforcement pressure put on the Panthers to define them as illegal and to just crush them was, and to define them as an outlier, um, that they weren't meeting the needs of the community when in fact they were. I mean, so you think about Fred Hampton, the work that Fred Hampton was doing in Chicago. Um, 
working with trying to work with the Blackstone Rangers, um, the largest gang there, to figure out how to turn that gang into um, a purveyor of something really positive and uplifting in the Black community. And the response coming out of the Chicago PD and the FBI was like, we have got to stop that political head from hooking up with that Black body. Um, and so sending, um, it's COINTELPRO, the counterintelligence program. And so sending information to eat to Hampton and to Jeff Ford saying they've got a hit out for you. The other has a hit out for you. They're trying to take you out um, to, to sow distrust. Um, and I think that the labeling of the Panthers, not as this organization um, put in place to, to defend the black community from police violence, from the, the, the ravages of a system that um, just extracted resources from that community and put that community in harm's way. That you've got this, this sense of let's, let's paint them as nefarious, as violent, as, 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 as a threat to the white community. And that will, that will shrink their, their base, that will make them not viable. Let's just put the incredible resources of federal law enforcement and of state and local law enforcement and bear down on this organization until we can cripple it. Um, you mentioned Kyle Rittenhouse um, a little bit ago and it made me think about in the 21st century, you know, which basically began right after Columbine, um, the conversation about guns in America is inextricably linked to mass shootings, as specifically school shootings. Those two things, I mean, they're still happening regularly, unfortunately. I've not seen one that I can remember that was not, for the most part, a young, white, disaffected male. Um, and it's almost to the point of you can almost guess it before they talk about who did it. Unfortunately, it's so it's so specific the the uh, person that you'd be looking for. Um, if for the last twenty years, all these mass shootings and all these school shootings had been done by black men, would we have different gun laws now? Oh yeah, <laughs> oh yeah. Um... The one of the things that I, 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 I laid out in my piece in The Guardian was that we've got these twin pandemics hitting the twin pandemic of mass shootings hitting up against the pandemic of anti blackness and that we we've, we've stoked the fear so long in this nation of black people that in the face of these mass shootings, we cannot get a reasonable response, a reasonable gun safety response because we've got this narrative of defenselessness. It almost sounds like George Mason back in the 18th century that, you know, if you take our militia, uh, we will be left defenseless against all of these black people. Um, you think about the couple in St. Louis uh, when Black Lives Matter um, marched and they came out of their homes with their guns. Uh, aimed at these people who did not have weapons. Um, when you think about the language of Ron Johnson talking about, I wasn't afraid about that insurrection um, because you know these were law-abiding people. But you know if that had been Black Lives Matter, okay. So that narrative of of being left defenseless with gun safety laws, it's being left defenseless uh, to Black people who were as we get the narrative, have, um, Jonathan Metzels, Dying for Whiteness, does a piece on this dealing with guns, uh, families that have dealt with gun violence, white families that have dealt with gun violence um, are in um, um, a help group, a support group. And the issue of gun safety comes up. And they're like, no, no, we don't want any of those laws because they'll take our guns and then those folks from St. Louis will come and take everything that we have. Um, and that's what we're looking at, how anti-Blackness short circuits. Um, 
common sense and that it says that we are willing to be unsafe in our schools. We are willing to be unsafe at the grocery store. We are willing to be unsafe in church just so that we can um, supposedly defend ourselves from this black horde that's coming to take everything that we have. Is that because, you know, it's impossible to truly be afraid and fully rational at the same time? Meaning, you know, how are we ever going to get past this if we're operating in that space? And, you know, whatever the cause was for a large swath of society to have this inherent fear of Black men and Blackness in that sense, or at least fear of giving certain tools or power to the Black community, I'm I'm always kind of like, how do you know, like, where do we go from here? I mean, it, it, I don't want to like be in total despair, but is that just a generational thing? Do we have to? How do you teach people to not be afraid of the other? And 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 so, what you can see right now is this backlash against teaching people how not to be afraid. Um, we critical have, race theory was just outlawed in Oklahoma. Yeah. Right, right. Critical race theory, the 1619 project, yeah. right, is getting banned. So teaching this history about how we got here um, is being banned because that kind of information, that kind of education is seen as um, destructive and detrimental to a project that is about power, maintaining power. Um, not about how you have a healthy, strong, vital, vibrant society, how you have a vibrant, multiracial, multi-ethnic, multi-religious democracy, but it is about maintaining power for a small swath of people and being willing to prey on fears to make that happen. You know, I wonder often if the terminology we use uh, impedes us in a certain sense. And a good example would be this. I often worry that people hear the term white supremacy, for example, and the first thing they think about is the Ku Klux Klan and like flags burning or uh, crosses burning in people's yards. And they don't think about it in terms of societal structures, you know? And it's very easy to say, well, I'm not, I'm not, you know, I'm not those people. I'm not, you know, obviously racist in that sense. And it's not even really about you as a person. It's kind of very much about the societal structures that we have in place to kind of keep certain people in power and others. And sometimes I worry that the, we kind of use different language, you know, if there's, and it, and it creates this barrier where, you know, you can't get past that labeling. And it's kind of civil rights era language that we're using in the 21st century that may not apply exactly to the, what we're trying to do. Well, you know, and, and this is, and so the, the thing that becomes clear is that there is no language that the, the structure will, will tolerate. Right. It's just the way that the nonviolent movement in the civil rights movement was absolutely intolerable to that power structure. Um, it's the way that Colin Kaepernick kneeling was intolerable as a means of protest. Um, it is the way that uh, saying that slavery is foundational and has to be examined in the ways that it has affected our nation, the way it has affected our laws, the way it has affected our religion, the way it has affected our food waste, the way it has affected our politics. Um, to say that, no, that never happened, is, is there's, there's nothing that is acceptable. Um, to this power structure because it's all seen as um, an attack, an assault, uh, a threat. And, and so it's dealt with that way. The, you know, one of the things I talked about in White Rage is how do you roll back civil rights? And one of those key ways was to redefine racism. And so racism is the Klan. Racism is the cross burning. But racism is not... Um, the, 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 the name, uh, a, a readily identifiable black name um, that doesn't get the job. Um, uh, the redlining, yeah. Yeah, yeah, all of those things. That's not that racism. Um, and, and racism 
in this, in this narrative is not the concern that black men are marching with guns, uh, just the way white men march with guns. Uh, that, that if you're not afraid of white men marching with guns, why are you afraid of black men marching with guns? Um, so, but that's not seen as racism. Um, that's just seen as being concerned. Uh, it, it's, 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 it's what happens that that anti-blackness that I'm talking about that is coursing through this history is affecting the ways that we live and die in America. You know, uh, we talk about American exceptionalism, uh, exceptionalism a lot, and it's a controversial topic, but in one way that America is quite exceptional is in our problem with gun violence uh, around the world. We have a question from one of our viewers, Wendy, who says, are there any societies the U.S. could use as a model for reform, or is the Second Amendment, with its unacknowledged racial underpinnings, the poison pill to U.S. civil society? It's a big question. Oh, Wendy, I love that. I love that language, the poison pill. Um, I have been likening the Second Amendment to the three-fifths clause, and that we need to treat the Second Amendment the way we have treated the three-fifths clause as a foundational principle embedded in our constitution. Can you explain what that is for people who may not know? Yes. So the three-fifths clause was the deal that was cut between Northern delegates and Southern delegates because the South was afraid that it would not have enough congressional representation in the legislature, in the federal legislature, to be able to, to block any kind of anti-slavery legislation coming through. And so they argued strenuously. I mean, this was the kind of sophistry that happens. They actually argued that their enslaved population needed to be counted as, as, as on, on the same equality as white men. And, and you had the Northern delegates going, excuse me, I'm sorry, do you count them for your state legislature? Um, do they vote? <laughs> um, and they're like, no, but we will, we will leave unless we get representation. And so the three-fifths clause was the compromise where, and the language is so, so opaque in the constitution about how you count for representation, but it was like anybody else, they get counted for three-fifths of your, of your being. And that is what gave the South disproportionate power in the US Congress. And so in that you have that three-fifths clause that is predicated on black inhumanity about not recognizing the basic rights of African Americans. In the second amendment, you have an, a, an amendment sitting in the bill of rights, in the bill of rights, that is about the denial of black people's rights. And so that second amendment, yes, it is a poison pill. I love that language. Mm -hmm. um, is there a nation that we can replicate, that we can model after? You know, what we need to model after are our aspirations. When we say we hold these truths, though that's what we need to model. We need to model what a truly vibrant, multiracial, multi-ethnic, multi-religious democracy looks like how it operates. That means that we, we, we remove the anti-blackness that's in there. That means we remove the misogyny that's in there. We remove the xenophobia that's in there. And we really begin to think about this nation has enormous resources. We begin to think about what it takes to be a vibrant nation where people's basic needs are met. That's what we need to, that's what we need to model. We need to model our aspirations. That means we're not denying people the right to vote who are eligible citizens. Uh, you know, people talk a lot about the COVID-19 pandemic and the fact that it is so widespread now that even with vaccines, the, the virus will be present around the world and we'll just basically have to make sure that we're staying vaccinated. And, but it's not as if we're going to eradicate it anytime soon. I wonder about the same thing with the proliferation of guns in America, meaning there are so many literally physical guns in this country, more than there are people, millions and millions and millions and millions of guns. The idea that we would have a society without them is, I think, foolish and irrational. Um, and so 
when you see laws, like you mentioned uh, that California at one point had this kind of open carry law back in the early days of the Black Panther Party, Texas is about to or on the verge of passing a, a what they call a constitutional carry, which basically means no permit, no license, no registration, just anybody and their grandma can carry a gun around. And do you see things like that and go, okay, and I will say on for their part, the police unions and everybody in Texas, I think were against that, were against that uh, and kind of went up against those power structures. But when those things happen, do you kind of see like, well, that's just one more pathway to killing more black men because they're gonna have the same right to carry guns as everybody else if it's constitutional carry, but are they gonna pay the bigger price for that? And, and, and because black is the default threat so you think about Philando Castile. Um, he had a licensed weapon and he was gunned down because he was a threat, he was dangerous. Um, you, 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 yes, yes. Um, and that's why I have the, a, a chapter in the book, how can I be unarmed when it is my blackness that you fear? Um, that it is whether you're armed or unarmed. Black is the danger. So it's, it's when a black man has a cell phone, he's gunned down because they thought it was, he had a weapon. He was carrying um, a, a gun with him. Um, we have too many of these instances um, that, that put black people in the crosshairs of this violence. Um, black as the default threat in the society. So if you have a gun, I'm automatically threatened. So it's, it's the danger of like stand your ground laws um, where stand your ground says that anywhere you have a right to be, you have a right to defend yourself. And if you feel threatened, if you perceive a threat, then you have the right to defend yourself. Well, when black is the perception of threat, anywhere that I have a right to be and I see black, I can perceive threat and that puts them in the crosshairs. Um, it is how George Zimmerman walks for killing Trayvon Martin, who was unarmed. Yeah, the uh, crime of wearing a hoodie. Um, and so in the I'm curious, you know, having read your work, um, what, what do you see as kind of like your overarching thesis for all of your work together. Obviously you're dealing with race in America and things like that, but you know, are you, do you kind of see it as, you know, you're tackling the vote, you're tackling, you know, like you said, white rage, you're tackling the second amendment. Do you kind of see this as part of a larger kind of mosaic of something you're trying to put together or do you kind of just go from, it, you know, issue to issue? Um, it is really part of a larger mosaic. My first book was called Eyes Off the Prize, uh, the United Nations and the African-American Struggle for Human Rights. And there I'm looking at the broad array of human rights and how African-Americans in the 1940s saw their struggle, like the NAACP saw the struggle not as a civil rights issue, but a human rights issue. A civil rights issue basically deals with the right to vote, uh, the right to not to be illegally searched and seized, the right to a fair trial, the right to assembly, the right to not have uh, cruel and unusual punishment. But human rights deals with the right to education, those rights plus the right to education, the right to housing, the right to employment. And they, they saw this larger vision that what slavery and Jim Crow had done was to eviscerate the human rights of African-Americans. Um, and so it was gonna take a human rights solution in order to deal with the human rights um, assault. Mm -hmm. And the Cold War, whoo, just eviscerated that. It just, it, it, it allowed those rights, the right, to, the right to healthcare to be labeled as communistic. This is what the Soviets want. Um, the right to education, the right to housing. Oh, that's socialism. That's, that's what those reds want. That's, that's what the communists say. And if you're advocating for that, and this is during the McCarthy era, then you must be a communist. You must be a communist led organization. And, and so I am, as a scholar, I am drawn to understanding the rights structure um, and the fractured citizenship that African-Americans have. How, 
what, what created those rights um, fissures and what are the strategies that have been deployed to try to overcome those, those, the denial of those rights, um, the, the fractured citizenship that African-Americans have? Um, once again, everybody, before we wrap up here, the book is the second. Uh, we have links here. You can buy it quite easily. It's a wonderful book to, to read, digest, and, and have conversations in your, your community with your, your, your friends and peers and family. Um, I'd like to wrap up by talking about what this work does to you in the sense of, you know, what I'm fascinated. I read these books, and but I don't get a sense that you are, you've given up on, on kind of, you know, there are topics that are, it would be easy to kind of be despondent and totally aimless as like, these problems are too big. I don't know what to do with them, but I don't get that sense from you that you feel like these are bridges that can't be crossed. Um, how do you kind of maintain any sense of optimism, especially when you're going so deep into some of these issues that have a lot of darkness to them? Um, I, I look at the the ways that Americans have fought back, that there has been this consistent understanding of the 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 horrific conditions that Black people have had to endure, and that there has also been this pushback, this refusal to accept that subjugation coming out of the Black community, and that you have those in the white community who are also like, no, this is not the America I signed up for. I want to be in a better America. And so that fight, that struggle um, has been consistent. And that's where the hope is. I mean, so you think about after uh, the, the US Supreme Court gutted the Voting Rights Act in the 2013 Shelby County v. Holder decision, and you had the slew of voter suppression laws so that they were so intense that in the 2016 election, black voter turnout went down by 7%. That would have been enough to go, whoo, but uh-uh. Organizations mobilized, mobilized. Um, and, and you saw this massive voter turnout in the midterm and in 2020. We're also seeing like white rage, the, the policies being pushed back to go, uh-uh, <laughs> we're not having that. But you're also seeing mobilization, so my hope is that folks don't capitulate. My hopes are, are really resting on a history of fighting for democracy, fighting for a vibrant, real democracy. That's where my hopes are. Um, before we let you go, you know, I will tell everybody that uh, Professor Anderson's family is from right here in Oklahoma. And so it's a bit of a, a virtual homecoming, uh, more of the central part of the state around uh, Oklahoma City area by uh, some of those places. But I do hope that um, at some point we'll get to have you visit here in person. And, uh, and uh, I can't tell you what uh, a powerful experience the book was and I wish you the best with it. I would encourage all of you guys to, to get a copy of once again, read the book and also just go back. If you haven't read, read White Rage or One Person No Vote, um, you know, spend some time with these books and uh, go out and do the work. So thank you, Professor Anderson, and uh, take care, everybody, and we'll see you very soon. Thank you. All right, bye-bye.